keeps on building capacity through seminars, conferences, uh, workshops, and, uh, and publications and research. We have discussed many of these things with the uh, cloth in, the, in there. And as already indicated, service delivery on the, con on the continent in many African countries, so to speak, is found wanting. And so we feel that building the capacity of people like you and especially students and all of you is very necessary so that we go back to work and we know how and what exactly we are supposed to do in order to enhance efficiency in whatever we do. The public and the citizens that we serve expect a lot of us and do not want us to be doing things in a very haphazard way. And so that is the essence why we want to build the capacity so that right from the word go, we know what we are supposed to do. The theme for this today's workshop has already been mentioned by Prof and uh, uh, Doctor, and it's on public debt in Kenya uh, under the COVID-19 shocks. Of course, the topic talks about Kenya, but it's a continental wide issue and the problems of Kenya are not too different from many other countries. I'm a Ghanaian and I listen to the news on, in, 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 in Kenya on a daily basis. And I can tell you for sure that the problems of Ghana and Kenya, as far as, as, as debt is concerned, even Kenya is better. So we, 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 it, is, it has become a big issue on the continent and which we are all grappling with. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 came to worsen the entire circumstances. And that is what is bringing the issues that we put on the table today for, discuss for discussion. Let me not go into COVID because it looks as if it is fading away and we don't want to remember, but you agree with me that it dealt a big blow to uh, all of us as an individual, but mostly as countries. And uh, the difficulties that it created is such that the pandemic created is such that uh, some of the problems, it will take us a long time to solve, even though we are trying to so, solve it. Of course, the trend even post COVID has created both new and old opportunities for us to, to, to follow. And one of them, as I've already been discussed, is the issue of the rising debt, which I believe I don't want to go too much into it because you are the guest speaker. The key problem with African continent deals with the issue of failure to, to deal with the service of uh, the debt service obligations. Of course, others say that when we collect the, 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 the borrowings, the way we use it is flout with some form of inefficiency. I don't know, maybe Dr. Ngugi will have to address some of this. And so government borrowings to finance investment
the Monetary Policy Committee at the Central Bank. Central Bank. Dr. Ngugi, or Dr. Rose for that matter, has published widely and has wide teaching experience, in, especially in the University of Nairobi. Her research interest is in public policy, the financial sector investment, reforms and institutional issues. And we are happy to inform you that she holds a PhD from the Business School of Birmingham University in UK. She has a master's and bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Nairobi. Uh, our four big speakers are also here. I'll introduce them as we go along. But at this point, I want all of you to join me to welcome, heartily welcome Dr. Rose Ngigi to take the floor and do his presentation. Let's begin a big clap. Dr. Ngigi, you have the floor. Good afternoon. I'm very, very happy to be here um, at Kenyatta University today. Uh, the last time I was here, there were not many uh, buildings. So when I've come today, I realize it's becoming a bigger and a bigger uh, city and also becoming a little bit congested. The, the last time uh, I came here, a lot of these buildings were not, were not there. It means that you're actually doing well. So you don't have issues of what you are talking today, <laughs> debt. Um, uh, Professor Caroline uh, Wula, the uh, DVC Academy. Thanks very much for accepting us uh, to be here today. Uh, Dr. George Scott, the first time we've met and I'm very happy to uh, uh, meet with you today. Dr. Richard Wafula, Happy to know that we did something good, but uh, he's also reminding the DVC that the, you, we have, they have not achieved what we, we proposed. Uh, Professor uh, David Minja, uh, thanks very much for um, inviting uh, uh, us here again. The panelists, um, they will take all your questions, yeah? So mine is just to give uh, uh, the lecture. So before I start the lecture, I just want to use two minutes uh, to uh, tell you about uh, the organization that I work for. Uh, that is the Kenya Institute for Public Policy uh, Research and Analysis. Uh, this is a government agent, agency under the State Department for Planning. And currently, we are under the National Treasury and Planning uh, Ministry. Uh, this year, we are celebrating 25 years since the foundation of KIPRA. And we are established uh, to push one key agenda of government in public sector reform agenda. And that is uh, to strengthen uh, the public policy uh, making process, more so by re-emphasizing uh, the fact that uh, evidence is everything in public policy uh, process. In achieving our, our mandate, we have quite a number of programs, but I can divide them into three. One of them is uh, uh, capacity building uh, with our niche in uh, public policy 
uh, process, anything to do with public policy that is uh, where we build capacity. And we have various programs. One of them is uh, uh, the Young Professionals Program. It's a one-year program uh, that uh, uh, we admit about uh, 30 uh, young professionals and they spend one year with us at Kipra. The only uh, requirement for you to join the, uh, the program is that you must have a master's, yeah? Uh, the other program in which uh, uh, we've had conversations with the professor, we call it a Kipra Mentorship Program for university students. Probably some of you have attended our events uh, in various uh, forums, but this is a, a mentorship program that um, helps us to engage with universities, uh, university community, uh, students, and also uh, lecturers. And we always request the universities to form a public policy uh, a research club. And through those research clubs, we are able to support um, our students to understand public policy matters. And we also invite students who agree to participate in the program uh, to our annual regional conference uh, every year. Um, in addition to capacity building, we do uh, research and our research cuts across um, all the ministries of government, but with a focus on economic policy, whether it's the Ministry of Energy, whether it's the Ministry of Industrialization, uh, whether it's the Ministry of uh, Labor, uh, we do all those aspects. So we have seven divisions that actually uh, touch on all those uh, uh, aspects. And then finally, uh, we have uh, our networking and engagement. Uh, we are happy to be uh, here today at uh, Kenyatta University uh, because uh, we embrace a partnership because we believe that uh, public policy as a process requires uh, all stakeholders to participate and as a university community, you are part and parcel of that process for public policy. Uh, I also want to uh, say that uh, uh, we engage with the public also through what we call our Kipra uh, public repository. If you are looking for any um, speech, budget speech from 1963, uh, please try and visit our, our repository. You'll get it so that you can understand more uh, what has been happening in uh, uh, public finance uh, uh, management. Uh, if you want to get uh, some session of papers, and one of the session of paper that everybody goes for in our repository is session of paper number 10 of 1965, and also session of paper number one, of 1986, the two session of papers uh, made a dif make a difference or made a difference in uh, the development uh, agenda uh, for this uh, country. So for today, uh, we are looking at uh, a key issue that everybody uh, is interested in and is also talking about, and that is. Uh, public debt. And we are discussing uh, public debt in the context of the COVID-19 uh, shock. So when I was preparing this uh, lecture, I, I didn't know what to put and what not to put. Uh, so I just decided uh, to uh, blend uh, for the students and also bring in aspects from the uh, policy angle uh, such that uh, uh, we are able to dialogue. And I'll ask more questions than providing answers so that uh, uh, we can all uh, have a very good discussion. 
So I'll start by uh, asking the very first question, and that is uh, how does public debt actually accumulate? I know uh, Dr. George Scott has uh, defined uh, what is public debt. It has everything to do with the government. It has nothing to do with your personal loans, uh, but it's everything to do with the government. So how does it come about? It comes about because um, there are budget deficits. And with budget deficit, then we finance uh, with public debt, and that's how uh, it starts accumulating. Anytime we have an exogenous shock like COVID-19, the government borrows in some situations because that debt acts as a, a shock absorber a shock absorber because you may be found unprepared uh, because you have limited uh, fiscal space and we'll get all these things uh, later. And you, when we look down on what happened during the COVID-19, you'll actually see that uh, that's a period when uh, debt actually increased uh, uh, in the country. So what happened uh, during the COVID-19 is that um, uh, the whole country was closed down. Uh, we were not going to school. Uh, we, uh, some of us lost jobs. And it means that uh, the whole uh, circular flow of income, and I'm happy that the debate started with our, our, our DVC, the whole issue of the circular flow is like, you know, when you have a ball, yeah? And you deflate it, yeah? So when you remove all the air, it means that it can collapse. At that moment, somebody must inject something into that circular flow uh, so that uh, it starts ballooning again. And this necessitated uh, government borrowing because it was not getting revenue from the domestic market. And that was the only way you could uh, resuscitate uh, the aggregate uh, demand. So as indicated by uh, uh, DVC, public debt actually increased uh, during this time uh, from 6.7 trillion in 2020 when the COVID uh, struck and currently to about seven, 8.6 trillion as of June uh, 2022. So looking at how uh, the debt is uh, accumulating, uh, we have to recognize the fact that uh, debt is an element of fiscal management. I know I'm using an equation, I think we have not gone there. And this is a very simple equation so that you can understand uh, uh, how uh, things can actually either get out of hand or they can actually be managed. So we are talking about new debt. So anytime, uh, uh, what triggers new debt? It is triggered because the primary deficit, uh, which is defined by government spending uh, minus government revenue, is not adequate or the deficit is growing. The reason why we have differentiated uh, the government spending and interest payments is actually to show you that any time current debt is uh, uh, is taken, it goes back to actually increase the debt stock. And when the debt stock uh, is there, it is accumulating uh, a servicing uh, because of the interest that you have to pay uh, for it, uh, such that uh, 
you will always notice that there is an increase on what we are saying uh, as the debt on the right hand on the right hand side of that equation but is also coming from the left hand side which we are triggering so uh, the two sides actually uh, talk to one another so anytime you have a, a gap on government spending vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the total revenue you are already triggering uh, to have a debt and when you have the debt uh, uh, taken this time it again accumulates with the debt stock that you had before and this increases the interest payments that you make each period so what has been the trends in uh, uh, debt stock in Kenya. You will notice uh, that uh, we have taken a, a wide area just to see what has been happening over time. And you'll notice that uh, uh, in 2002, 2003, uh, the government uh, came up with what we called the economic recovery uh, strategy. And a lot of good things actually happened. And during that time, we had the economy uh, booming. And what do you see? You see that debt over GDP is coming down. It's coming down because the base or the denominator uh, that we are using to define that debt is actually expanding. During the first uh, medium term plan one, uh, which implements the vision 2030 uh, between 2008 and 2012. Again, uh, this is a period uh, when the economy was again uh, growing, despite the fact that we had a shock uh, in 20708, one from the domestic uh, political violence, but at the same time, uh, the shock from outside with the financial uh, crisis. Things have changed. And during the MTP2, MTP3, we have many things happening. In 2013, a major thing happened in Kenya. We brought in devolution. And when you bring in devolution, then it means that you are cutting either the same cake uh, to many uh, mouths to feed, or you are expanding the cake so that you are able to uh, uh, ensure that everybody gets uh, their share. But from the growth perspective, the growth rate that we found between uh, 2002 uh, to, 20, uh, to 2007, has not been repeated again uh, of 6% of 7%. We are growing, yes, but we are growing at less than 6%. The vision 2030 anticipated that we should grow at 10%. And with 10%, we would be able to deal with aspects of poverty and we'll also uh, on our path. Uh, to a medium term, a medium, uh, middle income uh, country. So that's uh, the period when we see a significant increase in debt, but it was not in vain. This is also a period when we have seen significant investments, public investments that were being financed uh, through debt. The key question to ask is, uh, if you have huge investments, why is there no significant growth in GDP? Because the expectation is that when you increase uh, government investment in infrastructure, it should have a very higher uh, multiplier effect that would generate uh, more participation of public sector, and therefore you grow uh, the economic activity. The other thing that you'll notice is that uh, 
uh, since uh, 2001, just before uh, the economic recovery strategy, uh, we notice uh, the share of domestic debt was smaller, less than uh, 35 percent. But this ballooned uh, in the period uh, uh, when we are also accommodating uh, the devolution uh, element. But we, it was managed uh, slightly, but right now we have uh, an increasing element as far as domestic debt is concerned. It, is the it was the intention that um, we would have a kind of a shift from uh, a government competing with the private sector in the domestic market and borrowing from outside. Uh, but things don't always work that way. And uh, we have seen that uh, we have sustained uh, the domestic debt at higher uh, levels. So what happened uh, during uh, COVID? What happened during the COVID period is that um, COVID hit uh, when the government uh, had just adjusted the debt ceiling. The first time, sorry, they're not moving. Yeah. Next, sorry, I will now remind you. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, this is where I am. Uh, when COVID was hitting, uh, government had just uh, reviewed the debt ceiling. That is in uh, October uh, two, 2019. Uh, at that point, our debt ceiling increased from six, six trillion uh, to nine trillion. This year, um, in June, the debt ceiling has increased again from the 9 trillion uh, to the 10 trillion. What is all this thing about uh, increasing uh, the debt ceiling? If you go back to uh, the equation I had shown you, you'll notice that um, if you have a debt ceiling, if you have hit the debt ceiling, you may actually find yourself getting into debt crisis. And how would that happen? It would happen if you need new debt today, you are not able to actually uh, get that new debt because you have already reached the maximum, you have uh, obligations uh, to pay for the stock of debt yesterday. You are not able to pay for it and it can cause you to default. And the minute you default, it means that uh, the country is even rated very low. And when you have the country rated low, even going for debt outside becomes very difficult because you'll be charged a very high premium uh, when you get uh, to the external uh, sources. It also means that uh, if you hit the debt ceiling and uh, you are not able to uh, uh, finance your deficit with new debt, you have to sacrifice something. And what you sacrifice are the basic services that you receive uh, or that are funded uh, by the government. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the uh, uh, situations where uh, US Treasury uh, reaches a point and they're like, we are going to shut down. Have you had something like that? If you shut down the government, assume you wake up tomorrow and the government has shut down. What do you think would happen? 
Those who are traveling, would they travel? Those who are looking for IDs, would they get IDs? All of us would be, it will be a complication, it will complicate everything. The private sector person who was looking for license would not get that license. We have to safeguard from getting into such a, a situation. The composition, uh, next. The composition of ex external debt changed significantly during this period. And for the good, to some extent. Uh, in January, March, the level of multilateral debt uh, to the total debt was just 33 percent. In April, June uh, 2022, multilateral debt uh, was taking highest share at about 44.8 uh, percent. We all love multilateral debt because it is highly concessional. And being highly concessional, it means that uh, the debt burden that would come with such debt is low. However, multilateral debt may not allow you to do a lot of investments. Debt that we get, for example, from IMF, I'm sure uh, you remember that in March, uh, when we were hit by COVID, government started preparations to get some funding. And we went for the rapid credit facility from IMF. What? Good news, because when you get that, you are able to inject into the budget support. And after that, we went again for another facility. But what did IMF also do? it reduced the interest rates very significantly. And it also expanded the amount that you can borrow with your quota. Because borrowing from IMF, borrowing from the World Bank depends on the size of your quota. The smaller it is, the smaller the amount you yes. get. The bigger it is, the bigger uh, the amount uh, that you'll get. So, to some extent, uh, this was made possible also because uh, other donors, other development partners were also hit by the same, same shock that we had. And therefore, uh, this was actually uh, kind of slowing down in terms of uh, opportunities that uh, were available to look for debt. But we were also lucky during that time because we were also able to float um, uh, uh, the euro bond. But how do we compare with, for example, uh, what you'd call uh, uh, comparators uh, or aspirators? And when you go, when you think about the BRICS, the BRICS including uh, Indonesia, you'll notice that, uh, yes, we are relatively within that line. We are relatively okay, as far as the size is concerned, but that should not uh, cheat you because uh, the size of debt and the ability to pay for debt are very different things. Uh, we may be having a debt of about 68, 70%, and we say we are much lower maybe than South Africa, but South Africa, given the size of its economy, may be in a better position to repay uh, its, its loan. What about at East African level? At East Africa level, this is how it looks like. Um, with our neighbor Tanzania and Uganda, they are a bit low, but it looks like Rwanda and Burundi, we are all catching up uh, as far as the uh, debt is concerned. And uh, George, Dr. George Scott, Ghana is also there, and we are almost uh, uh, seeing ourselves uh, uh, growing our debt. Remember during this time of COVID, 
something uh, came up from the G7 uh, countries, uh, the debt, uh, the DSSI, debt uh, servicing suspension initiative. It was only there for a short time, but what it was able to relieve is what I showed you as the RDT minus one. So if you, re, if you, if you tell me that, uh, don't worry about this element in your, in your fiscal management for some time, it means that you are giving me some aspect breathing, to breathe uh, and also to allocate my resources in a more uh, uh, urgent uh, areas. But what has happened, let's look at now those components. Let's look at uh, the revenues and spending. If you look at um, uh, our revenues and our, and our spendings, you'll notice that Okay. Oh, great. You'll notice that um, um, government expenditures are higher than revenues as a ratio to GDP. The wider the gap, the more the new debt uh, would be accumulated. So now I use this one. Sorry, I use that, yeah? You've gone, yeah? Okay, but what's going on uh, in our country? If you look at uh, this uh, graph, what you'll notice is that the straight lines, they are telling you where we are in different periods with the targeted revenue. And the bars are showing you where we have always been with our actual revenues. Have you seen any of them which is touching the target vis-a-vis -vis the revenue? We've not managed. It's either we are very ambitious or as uh, Dr. Scott was saying, there could be leakages as far as the re actual revenue uh, is concerned. For whatever the case, anytime uh, you are setting up the uh, targeted revenue, you are considering so many things. Among them is economic growth. The minute economic growth is not realized, then you expect that uh, uh, the revenues that you are generating will also be lower. So a key thing is to maintain the growth momentum of the country. And then when you look at the composition of uh, the government revenue, you'll notice that um, government uh, finances its expenditure through tax revenue, what you and I uh, collect, non-tax revenue, uh, which uh, uh, we pay through licenses and the like, but also it receives some grants. But in the Kenyan context, the grants are very, 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 very small. So the government relies so heavily on tax revenue. And that is why there is always an emphasis for you and I to pay our taxes uh, because that is the key source of uh, financing government uh, expenditures. And then when you look at um, uh, what uh, National Treasury is also able to dis dis uh, disburse every year across uh, the financial year, you'll again notice that there are disparities uh, between what was targeted and what is uh, actually uh, released. To some extent is because either the absorption level is low or in other situations is because you have to readjust because the revenues are not uh, forthcoming. I know you are aware that currently, uh, the government is looking for how much? 300 billion. Where will it come from? A reduction in the expenditures. So the budget that was uh, read uh, in April, there would be changes as far as uh, the targets and the actuals are concerned. And 
the story is not just uh, uh, for at national level, the story is also at uh, uh, county government uh, levels. So when we set targets and we say, this is the amount of government expenditure we are expecting, we already have a back of our mind, the amount of growth that is expected, the amount of growth that you are injecting through government expenditure. So when we don't meet also that level of government expenditure, uh, because the absorption rate maybe is very low, it means that uh, uh, we will not also achieve as much uh, in uh, uh, what we are expecting. So we come back to the aspect, now we have finished with the aspect of uh, G minus T, and we are now on the aspect of R, D, T minus one. And this is what is happening. Trends in our debt payments, if you look at them, they have been increasing over time. Uh, the external debt uh, servicing to total debt service, uh, you can see uh, the levels that we are playing with, uh, almost a third of our debt servicing is actually for external debt. But most importantly is what is happening with our revenue. We collect our revenue, but you can see how much is going to debt servicing. Can you remember that equation? Uh, Rd minus one, that's what we are saying. You are increasing so much that at T, you are actually spreading so much to debt servicing rather than taking it to government uh, expenditures that are non-interest. And where you would find, for example, infrastructure being done, uh, health, uh services being provided and the like so that's the picture uh that we have but of interest is um sorry yeah of interest is uh, whether debt is sustainable or not sustainable and there are thresholds that uh, set which you can use to uh, check whether you are within uh, the, the limits, you are within uh, the green and amber area and not in the red. So if you look at uh, the thresholds, they differ with the um, uh, indicator uh, that you are using. For example, external debt is over GDP we have a threshold of 40%. If you, if you cross that line, then something uh, is not good. Uh, ex external debt over exports, 180. Uh, external debt uh, services uh, over exports at 15. External debt service over revenue at 18. And then we have the overall public debt over GDP at 55. I don't know what you are seeing as far as those figures are concerned. And I want to ask you whether we are attaining debts, is our debt sustainable? Those are the figures. You can argue for debt being sustainable if you are looking at external debt service over revenue. Uh, you can also argue uh, I think that's the only one. Uh, yes, with the external debt of a GDP, but with the others, there's something that we need to be very vigilant about uh, so that we can, we, we avoid getting to uh, the uh, high levels of debt uh, risk. So all the time you'll notice in the literature that we use expenditure, sorry, external debt or debt of a GDP because it's a very good measure of the ability of a country to pay its debt. So then we ask if, if truly, and that is true, if deficit is the key source of debt, then the question is, uh, can we tell 
the level of deficit that we need to sustain our debt sustainability. Is there a level of primary deficit that we'll be very comfortable with uh, such that uh, the economy can keep running? And if you go back to that equation I gave you, and you do a lot of arithmetic, it will actually come down and tell you this is where, uh, this is the equation that helps you to determine uh, the level of primary deficit that would help you uh, to ensure that debt is sustainable. I'm sure you've heard about the fiscal consolidation matters, isn't it? So when you're talking about fiscal consolidation, we are actually focusing on the primary deficit to bring it into a level uh, that will not see the debt actually exploding. And it's all defined by the rate of interest that you're paying and also the rate of growth of the economy. If the rate of interest is higher than the rate of growth of the economy, then you must uh, strive to have a primary surplus. If the interest rate is slightly lower than the G GDP growth, then we say that you can actually operate uh, with a deficit without uh, necessarily putting pressure on the debt uh, GDP uh, ratio. So we then ask, um, how are we doing as far as the economic recovery is concerned? Uh, from COVID. And this is the picture that I have. This picture is uh, combining three things, GDP growth, uh, overall inflation, and NSE index. NSE index is a very good predictor of economic growth. And if you look at it, it's been declining since uh, 2018, actually late 2017. The trend of NSE index has been going down. And I'm very happy that our, our president was visiting the NSE market the other day because that gives a good injection of uh, good spirit to see investors actually coming into the market. But when you look at this, you'll also see that there is a good correlation uh, between GDP growth and the trending of NSE. Yes, we are in the recovery path as far as, uh, uh, as, far as uh, uh, GDP is concerned. But remember, uh, for example, uh, in 2021, what we did is to bounce back. Have you ever had a ball? You bounce it down and uh, bounces up, yeah? But then the question is, when you have bounced it up, how do you sustain growth? That's the key question that we need to ask ourselves today. In the post-COVID era, how do we sustain strong economic growth? Because that will have implications on our debt. And then I want to ask this question, can we do without debt? So we hate it, but we like it, yeah? So, uh, and why we can't do without debt is because uh, you need a lot, you need the government to finance several things. You need the government to invest because through investment, you enhance the capacity for the economy to grow. How you finance infrastructure then becomes a key question. For a while, Kenya has been financing its infrastructure uh, through borrowing uh, from outside. Of course, there is government consumption, but if you look at government consumption as, for example, provision of education, provision and the like, you feel good because you are building the human capital. But if 
if we take too much of consumption to just wages and salaries, then that becomes a problem because uh, you then are not necessarily uh, saying that uh, you are making uh, a huge impact uh, in the welfare, uh, sorry, in the activities uh, of the economy. You also need government to spend because you want to improve social welfare. The transfer payments, uh, I know at the moment uh, subsidies is a very big debate, is a transfer in itself. I know that uh, we have the social protection. It was enhanced at some point during the COVID period. It's a transfer to enhance welfare. We have not managed as a country, for example, to come up with a compensation to those who are unemployed, right? There are some countries where they say knocking the door, yeah? So you can go there and you can get something to keep you, to sustain you. We are not yet there on our welfare state uh, as a country. Uh, of course, financing interest rates, uh, because if you default, then you are not able to, uh, uh, you, you get into a vicious circle that's spiraling, spiral, spiraling down rather than spiraling you upwards. So in financing, therefore, uh, you'll notice that government spending, they are there from government revenue. If it's not enough, external financing and also foreign grants that are not always uh, uh, enough. So in a nutshell then, uh, what you'll notice in the debate of uh, public debt is that um, we need to balance we need to balance growth, development, and the availability of domestic resources in ensuring that we are moving the next level, even as the Vision 2030 tells us to a middle-income country where we are all enjoying a good life. And what solutions have been given? How many of you have read the uh, Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto. This is where I've gotten them from. Because we have to look forward, isn't it? We have to ask ourselves with a new government, what do we see as the proposals uh, for addressing government debt? And one of the things that uh, is coming out clearly, even with the 300 billion uh, um, uh, a target that uh, that's there for, for, for government expenditure is that we need to get back to fiscal consolidation. We need to get back to that path uh, which would uh, keep us in a sustainable level. 3% is the magic, uh, uh, magic deficit uh, uh, level. So if we were to reduce from the current uh, of a 7%, we would then be uh, in a more uh, sustainable path which means that the G minus T will not put a lot of pressure on the new debts on the left-hand side of that equation. The other thing that you have seen, uh, and I'm very sure you are watching uh, TV and seeing the president at the Nairobi Stock Exchange, is the emphasis on privatization. Uh, privatize so that you can get money that is not from tax, but from sale of uh, uh, sale of some government properties. Um, if you look at the literature, there's a literature that uh, talks about uh, China and its ability to finance its activities from taxless financing. You have government with a lot of property selling it and using those funds to develop the economy. You need very good structures that can actually help you to do such kind of uh, uh, a thing. So how we finance the infrastructure becomes still a, a very big uh, uh, issue for the government because we have always uh, relied on external financing. Can we have something from the domestic uh, market? And of course, uh, as we indicated, um, you are trying to balance everything. You are trying to balance even welfare. 
uh, there is an element of prioritizing key issues of water, health, environment, and ensuring that the projects, the grants that we get actually support this uh, expenditures so that our G is fully funded without having to look for additional, additional debt. Securitizing uh, outstanding bills, good thing, but when you securitize today, tomorrow, how do you manage to ensure that you don't have outstanding bills? Credible macro framework and growth strategy. If we have a, a good growth strategy, it means that the GDP can grow. We can expand uh, the denominator, which we are using to say debt of a GDP ratio. And we can also say that uh, we are enhancing our ability to pay uh, our debt. And of course, we can't go without uh, uh, debt management. We have to do to strengthen debt management. And at the same time, uh, strengthen uh, project management so that we have projects with higher uh, multiply effect uh, to ensure that you generate uh, more economic activities that will help in future uh, uh, enabling not just to repay the loans, but at the same time uh, to give each one of us a good life. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nguge. Now we are going to enter into another session, which is going to be moderated by myself and Dr. Scott. Uh, just a few issues that have been raised in that um, discussion well, as they prepare. It's the issue of public debt. How do we create it? How does it get accumulated? the size of debt in this country and our ability to pay is it sustainable or do we have uh, sustainability issues uh, in thank you um so the other another issue that has come up is can we do without debt um so we have, uh, there are quite a number of issues that have been raised, very important. And perhaps those issues that have been raised in that uh, lecture have elicited some questions from your end. And so I will uh, invite three gentlemen to come. And uh, I can even see there are more seats, so we'll know who else is going to come and uh, respond to various questions, but that will be done by Dr. Scott. So the three panelists uh, that are going to answer our questions, uh, one of them, Dr. Anthony Mveyange, please come. He is the executive director, Partnership for African Social and Governance Research. Let's clap for him. Dr. Mbeyange, I don't know whether that's the way to pronounce, he will tell us. Uh, the next uh, panelist is Dr. Abraham Rugo, Country Director and Executive Director of International Budget Partnership Kenya, uh, Daktari. And then we have Mr. Patrick Gashagwa, he's the head of uh, Center for Leadership and Public Policy at the Kenya School of Government, uh, Mr. Gashagwa there. Now, these brains will answer all the questions that you have. And of course, we will not let loose Dr. Ngugi because she's the one who has actually been speaking to us. So she will still stay where she is. She will sit where she is. And the, yeah, oh, what had to come here. So I hear Dr. Ngoke, they want you to. <laughs> uh, yes, um, 
No, we'll allow her to stay where she is, but she will still be involved in answering questions. Uh, we were also expecting Dr. Uh, we were also expecting one more, but uh, he is yet to be with us. Um, maybe my, my question, you will decide, but before they answer uh, our questions, uh, they will just, will gi I'll give each just two minutes to tell us something about public debt. And perhaps the leading question here will be, you'll decide who is going to start. Uh, the issue of national debt, is it for our benefit? Does it come to impoverish us? Where does this money go? Because we hear billions uh, borrowed locally and uh, globally. Of course, we see roads and we see other forms of infrastructure. So what would you say about public debt and um, citizen welfare? Uh, so I will, I'll, anyone can start us off. Uh, so is it for good or is it for ill? And then Dr. Scott will pick from there. Dr. Scott. Okay, that's a very, it's a, it's a packed question. Is it for good or is it for ill? Yes. <laughs> There's no politician in the house, right? I don't want to respond and then police will be waiting for me outside. <laughs> well, let me first thank you so much for this opportunity to appear before this great conversation. And thank you, Dr. Ngugi, as always, you don't, you always hit the notch. And I really enjoyed your conversation about public debt in Kenya. Uh, and as an economist, Daniel, I think it made Daniel, me go back to the team and as well, then I started so remembering the right, 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 right questions. But I would like to speak about public debt more broadly if, across the continent. And, uh, uh, recently, I did a talk with BBC on Sri Lanka and what was happening in Sri Lanka. And the question was exactly that. What does it mean for Sri Lankans to decide to take things on the street and overthrow the government. I think the challenge that we see, before I say whether it's for good or for ill, the challenge we see with our countries, they are quite numerous. And I know perhaps for, for her own reason, Dr. Ngugi didn't want to get into them. Public debt is like a disease. It's like cancer, it's cancerous in nature. So if you're lucky, you can treat it. If you're not lucky, it can continue to, to you know, eat you slowly. So in some instances, when we argue that public debt is, is for good, it's contingent on many things. One of them is good governance, rule of law, and fiscal discipline, which is a challenge in many of our countries in Africa. We tend to borrow, and what do we use that money for? That's the question that most of the time citizens and the general public tend to ask. You're borrowing, and then what do you use that money for? You borrow, and then you go to Dubai. You borrow and go with a big trip of delegates financed through debts. Or you borrow and invest in meaningful development projects that can have ripple effect in the economy. When there's no lack of, when there's lack of financial fiscal discipline, when there's lack of rule of law and governance and checks and balances, the tendencies that we have seen in the continent and not only in Kenya, in many countries is public debt becomes an ill. It becomes an ill. And that tends to spill over what we saw in Sri Lanka, what we saw in Sierra Leone, because debt are not sustainable. Governments can't afford. We saw at least Zambia recently, their president managed to negotiate a concession with IMF, but things were getting out of hand. So the question that I think we should also pose to ourselves is for how long are we going to continue to borrow? For how long are we going to be independent and sustainable, sustainably so? This is a, this is a, a decades, lots of decades of research have been done. This is the question that has been hunting debt dependency syndrome for African countries. When should we stop talking about debt dependency syndrome? Because this is something that is eating us. And I think it is manifesting even in the way the knowledge is transferred. People who are in the public policy space, they think that borrowing is a fashion. It shouldn't be a fashion. Where do the Europeans go to borrow from? 
German, after World War II, they invoked Marshall Plan in 1945, right? A few years down the line, German is no longer, it's free. What is wrong with Africans? Taiwanese, the tiger economies, they have done the same. What is wrong with us for the last seven, eight decades since independence, we continue to talk about debt dependence economies. So I think, I think in this conversation, we should start also to think out of the box, trying to ask ourselves, this, we have inherited debts. We are paying debts from our grand grandfathers. Our children are going to continue for how long that is going to be. Are there ways we can think about how we can productively change our economies? That I think the conversation should be. So let me say, yes, to conclude, debt can be for good if there are some preconditions in the economy and those conditions are here too. But it can be a source of ill if such conditions are not there. Thank you. Thank you very much. You continue from there. But there's a suggestion here that the uh, time is already o'clock. So we'll combine the issue of questions from the floor from the listing. So the, uh, in addition to what Prof suggested, what we are going to do is to allow each of you to do three minutes, two minutes general opening of your comments. Yeah. Then we open for yeah. questions from the floor and any of you can, can answer that question. So three minutes. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, when it comes to debt, as we have uh, heard from our key presenter, uh, I, would, I would say that we can look at it from uh, two perspectives, uh, the good and the, and the bad side of it, uh, based on what economists have said in the past. Uh, the Keynesians would say that debt is not bad. And uh, when we say that debt is not bad, uh, it means if this debt is coming to finance a government expenditure, then they are talking of what we would call an expansionary fiscal policy. That is, uh, if we are expanding, if we are expanding government expenditure, uh, going by the basic uh, uh, GDP, uh, the, the basic GDP equation of y is equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus m uh, and from our uh, from our lecture you've uh, you discovered that uh, the, the debt was always or was almost uh, all the time given as a ratio of gdp and therefore we need to be very very uh, critical about gdp so if we are accumulating debt and gdp is not expanding uh, it means that we are sinking more and more into a debt crisis. And therefore, even as we go to, uh, to increasing debt, we have to be very, very wary of the direction in which our, our, GDP, our GDP is going. So, for example, if this debt is going to finance, is going to finance projects that will stimulate economic growth and bring an expansion of GDP, then it means, according to the Keynesians, a fiscal, an expansionary fiscal policy is good uh, because it is making the economy to, uh, to expand. Uh, the danger is when, uh, for example, this debt uh, is borrowed. Uh, sometimes it is... Uh, a foreign currency denominated and uh, the, debt pay, the debt repayment, that is the payment of principal interest and the uh, exchange rates, uh, for example, the, the Kenya shilling going down against uh, uh, hard currencies complicates the issue of resurfacing this debt. So to that extent, to the extent that uh, debt uh, debt financing or financing our deficit, our budget deficit through debt is an expansionary fiscal policy to that extent, 
uh, I would say it is good. Thank you very much, Mr. Patrick Gachakwa. Now, Dr. Abraham Rugu, three minutes. Thank you. I'll make sure I stick within those three minutes. So uh, I've listened very carefully, and thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Ngugi. I have uh, the joy of working in government, so I'll say it as it is. Uh, um, I think we are not talking about ifs. We are talking of a current situation, a present reality. The present reality is that one, us dealing with our technical problem. So we are not just dealing with a technical problem. You see, public expenditure happens in a context of a political arena of priorities, of decisions, trade-offs, and many other decisions that have to be made on day to day. What you see over time when we find ourselves in the current situation is that politics has almost overrun prioritization where you have expenditure growing even when revenues are falling. And I didn't have time to show uh, the, 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 the numbers, but you see that. So you see deficit in year. So we start with a deficit of 100 shillings, then the deficit grows to 120 shillings, what you would expect is that if revenues go down, then you expect the, 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 the deficit to go down. You don't expect the deficit to keep growing because somebody Aria, says, if we really cannot to, achieve our revenue targets, why don't we reduce our expenditure? So that's one. The second thing is, uh, sorry, and related to that, therefore, I think the current crisis, the current dilemma or trilemma, whichever you want to call it, we are in now is a governance and a leadership problem, not just a technical problem of numbers. It's not about ceilings. It's not, we can, put, we can put the ceiling even at 15 trillion if we want. But when you have a governance problem that you know, does not want to engage with the trade-offs, these projects that we are talking about you know, are the transparency question. Uh, 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 when you look at, for instance, the amount of money that we have spent on different, on different aspects of it, how, how much do we know of where the state-owned corporations, for instance, are a huge, a huge set, you know, spending about 30% of, 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 of our budget. How much of economic productivity are they engaged in? We have bailed Kenya Airways, I think, I don't know how many times we have, we have been bailing out. So there's that whole angle of uh, the governance question. But the second point that I want to say, our constitution in Article 201 states that the benefits and the burdens of public debt shall be shared equitably between current and future generations. And that raises the question of what are we investing in? The story that is in this week, for instance, is that Kenya has had to pay a penalty for SGR. Now, SGR is a small amount in the comparative, in the global figure, because it's about 500 billion, uh, if you think about it. But we are talking of about 8 trillion uh, uh, growth in public debt over that time. The 7.5 trillion that we are talking about, what kind of investments has it put in? And secondly, we are a labor-intensive society. In other words, you have more and more people who need to be put to work so that whichever investment, so for instance, you build SGR, let me use just as an example, you bring labor, you bring materials, you bring almost everything from China, yet you have a labor intensive society because it's only by creating labor by, that you create circulation of money in people's hands, you improve their ability to consume the products uh, that you are, are engaging. So, so I just wanted to say that the equity question, the distributive question, the investment question, those are not necessarily just technical questions of cost and benefit analysis. They are also governance questions. They are also political questions. And those of us who have engaged with the current government of the day, we have raised the same with the, with the president that these are governance issues that need to be fixed because if you don't fix them, it does not matter how much we try to balance the equation. And of course, in addition to what Anthony has said, I stop there, thanks. Did you stop talking because I've got a, it's not because of you that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so now 
Doctor, uh, I assume that you have spoken, or you want to? <laughs> okay, two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanted to echo a couple of points that my colleague has said. The first one is on foreign denominated don uh, debt. And we know now what is happening in the United States with inflation and the way the central bank, the Federal Reserve is fighting inflation in the US by hiking interest that has an implication on our countries. And uh, um, conversation now, of course, are on inflation and what it means, but how central banks are fighting such inflation and what is the ramification? What are the ramifications for developing countries that have borrowed, for example, in dollars? When interest rates are hiking in other countries, they have ramification, they increase interest payments and the burden for our countries becomes heavier. And it has the intergenerational ramifications that Abraham is talking about. And I think what the other point that I wanted to, think, to, to sort of mention, so we talk of debt, we talk of, I wanted to talk about Africa's and Kenyan particularly uh, productive capacity. Recently, the Kenyan government through the Kenyan 2030 vision has been engaged engaging with United Nation uh, anchored competitiveness, building Kenyan competitiveness. And I was part of uh, moderators and in certain the panels. And the conversation has always been, how do you build competitiveness of the Kenyan economy and African economies for that matter, to be able to respond to what Abraham is referring to. When you build SGR and you are ordering everything from China, it defeats the purpose really. Uh, these days you hear during Magufuri, he was pushing for local content so that the locals tend to benefit from such mega projects, right? Now, there are several areas that I can see low hanging fruits that our governments can think about. One is fiscal consolidation, which Dr. Ngugi talked about, which is very important. Fiscal consolidation in layman terms means reducing deficits and controlling accumulation of debt, okay? Very important. But I think what is also important is concentration, thinking of improving export competitiveness, very important, because a huge chunk of what we spend comes from inputs, you know, high fuel prices. That means the government of Kenya and many African governments have to spend a huge amount of in input bill. And input bill tend to be dominated in foreign currencies. I think it's about time to think about how competitiveness how do we think about import substitution? I remember the president told Ugandans, if you can't eat bread, eat muhogo. muhogo. Because bread is coming from Ukraine. And Ukraine and Russia, they're in offensive. Why don't you just eat muhogo? Or substitution for our countries. Thank you. OK. Uh, honorable Deputy Vice Chancellor, guest speaker, ladies and gentlemen, uh, students, we have listened to very brilliant presentations from Dr. Rosingugi, Dr. Anthony Mwenge, Mr. Patrick Kachagua, and Dr. Abraham Rugo. These are very, 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 very brilliant. Let's give them a very big hand. Okay, so the next item, the next uh, trend of the program is as follows. We are allowing 20, 25 minutes for questions. And then the questions can be taken, the answers can be taken by any of you. Uh, after the open questions, then I'll hand over the program back to Prof to take us to the end of the program. We have two sets of participants. Those of you physically sitting here, and there's a lot of many others who are listening online. So now for the 20 minutes ahead, any of you can ask any question, whether from online or from physical. There's no good question. There's no bad question. Feel free and ask any question. The floor is opened and the speakers will be ready to take each question. Thank you. We'll take three, four questions at a time. Number one, number two, number three, number four. Yes, number one. Thank you. Um, uh, 
I trust oh, you. Oh, wait a bit. Okay, let's let's go through. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, George Scott. My name is Victor. Uh, firstly, allow me to extend my sincere appreciation to uh, Dr. Rose. Uh, and uh, more, more specifically, again, to Dr. Abraham. Um, we've been in touch, um, especially on our events from the economics team. Yeah? And uh, Dr. Rose as well for partnering with us during our East African Economic Symposium. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, just to retaliate, my name is Victor Kimwamu. Uh, uh, and uh, for starters, I want to thank Dr. Ross, our chief guest for today, all our guests, and uh, more sincerely again, uh, Dr. Abram and Dr. Rose, we've partnered before as Kipra and uh, our association from economics during the East African Economic Symposium. You are part of our partners, and Dr. Abram was part of our panelists as well. So I'm, uh, at the moment, I represent the Kenya Economic Student Association as their team lead. I have two questions. Like I said, no question is good or bad. Um, so I'll ask. So my, my, my first question is, uh, uh, in, in, in March last year, the IMF said that uh, most of Kenya's external public debt remain on concessional terms, yeah? And um, we can all agree that the overall uh, public debt has been increasing over the years, yeah? So perhaps uh, now that Dr. Rose is here and the African Association of Public Administration and Management are also here, what policies can you therefore put forward to help reduce the vulnerabilities of our country. Maybe a last question is, uh, uh, you know, unless we limit government expenditure and borrowings, Kenya's fiscal gap will continue to widen. Yeah? However, to sustain this, the government has always been increasing the scope of tax to increase revenue beyond the optimal point. So then my question is, um, do you think this has been exerting pressure on the existing tax regime? And uh, what can we do about that? Yeah. Thank you very much. So make sure that our questions are modified to be straight and precise. Number two. Who was number two? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm Omil John. I have interest in economic modeling. My question is, what's the effect of public debt on psychological characteristics of citizens of a nation which affect economic growth. I repeat the question. What's the effect of public debt on psychological characteristics of a citizen of a nation which affect economic growth? In other words, I have a feeling that if we have debt, the, the citizens become uh, aggressive. So it has got an effect on investment. Thank you. Thank you. Number three. Yeah, number three is here. OK. I'm Maina Wahaba, uh, Vice Chairman, Kenyatta University Students of Public Policy and Administration. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rose for your presentation. And now, as we were going on, I had this question, uh, which was, why are African countries still in debt? And then Dr. Abraham Rugo answered it by saying that governance and leadership is the problem. And no matter how hard we try to balance the equations, we are going nowhere without fixing this. So what do you recommend on how we should handle this governance and leadership problem, since I believe that the next Dr. Ross Ngugi is right here, and the next leaders are still in, are still in here, sorry. And so if you will recommend the solutions, maybe you will fix the next future. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last question for this set. Good 
thank you, Iti, for uh, your presentation, and thank you, panelists, for that insight. Mine is, uh, would like to know what are the cross-cutting reforms that has worked in data states? Because we are in an era where we want what worked. What works for us? Good. So the floor is open for the speakers who take, take them at random. Who is taking? Go, go ahead. Uh, I'll start by uh, the second question. Uh, the, 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 the one on modeling. Uh, one thing that we need to understand as human beings is that uh, we base our decisions on what we see in the environment. And therefore, decisions that government take, for example, on a, on a debt, uh, raises or affects people's expectations. Because uh, once, for example, they generate income, they have to make investment decisions, and consumption decisions, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, debt, as we have seen, uh, affecting our economy in one way or the other, uh, therefore will have an impact on, uh, on the psychological, uh, it will have a psychological impact on the, on the people as a result of how uh, they prioritize or how they, uh, how they uh, manage uh, their expectations. And then there was uh, the question on debt. Uh, the, the IMF, uh, the issue of IMF and the uh, issue of uh, uh, concessional, the, uh, concessional terms and the policies that uh, we need to put forward. Uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that uh, uh, whether it is IMF or whether it is World Bank, uh, when they are giving uh, us or they are helping us to come out of our debt, uh, or even when they are, uh, they are loaning us funds, uh, sometimes there are conditions that uh, we may expect to, they may expect us to meet. And uh, these expectations sometimes uh, may be painful in one way or the other. For example, in the recent past, you see that uh, Kenya is moving closer to closer uh, to what uh, we would call a welfare state. Uh, you find that uh, there is a lot that the government is pro promising in terms of social, social welfare. And uh, as my colleague indicated, it has, a political, uh, it has a political push because social welfare uh, is pleasant in politics. But as the politicians speak loud about social welfare, uh, do we also ask ourselves, where will this money come from to finance this, uh, this welfare? And uh, from our lecture we had, uh, it, was well, uh, it, was, it was well indicated that if government has to spend money, it will have to come from somewhere. On one hand, and where, uh, for example, our government gets uh, money from is taxation. It means, on the other hand, then, uh, we have to adjust, uh, to adjust our, our taxes. So if the debt that we get does not go to finance projects that have impact on economic growth, then the debt burden uh, continues to, to increase. So at the moment, this is what I would want to say. Okay, yes, I, I, can, I can tackle the first, the first uh, speaker who asked the question on vulnerability and optimal tax policy. How do we mitigate against vulnerabilities against debt for our countries? And it has been there for many years. But I think as one to echo what Dr. Abraham said, governance, rule of law is important. Fiscal discipline, extremely important. Fiscal consolidation that Dr. Ngugi talked about, which is the manifesto of Kenya Kwanzaa. As I said, the fiscal consolidation, reducing deficits and accumulation of debt. Starting to look inward in terms of what are the productive capacities within Kenya that can be exploited. How do we widen tax base? Because the challenge we see here, and in most African countries, uh, is, is the tax base is very narrow. And, and how then do you, and then I'm, I'm responding to your second question as well on optimal tax policy. Uh, 
what we see recently, we have seen a movement across countries to even get charging and on mobile platforms, digital platforms for payments. Mm -hmm. It's just a desperate move by our governments to increase the tax base because all the other sources have been exhausted. But there's also a question of what is this tax? You are talking of optimal tax policy. Citizens to comply for voluntarily to comply to pay taxes, they need to see what these taxes actually do. And that's the challenge in many countries. I understand there's a project in Kenya which was looking at the behavioral response of Kenyans to voluntarily respond to tax compliance. Uh, not because the sources are not good enough, perhaps they're enough, but there's a lot, a lot of leakages. There's a lot of uh, political economy, let me put it that way, getting in the way uh, in terms of how tax collection is done. But at the same time, if citizenry are not happy with what the taxes are used for, this has always, has always been controversial in public policy. This has always been controversial in our countries. Accountability, what are these taxes used for? I pay a lot of taxes. I still go to uh, Ushago. There's no proper social services, social welfare you're talking about. I was privileged to live in Scandinavian countries. And I can tell you, if you ever want to live in countries that people are happy, Scandinavian countries, people are very happy. I used to pay tax 50% of my income then. But I would go, school is free, health is free. In fact, I used to teach in a university where students, all the way to PhDs, fully funded, they are paid to go to school. And they are very happy to pay taxes because they see the benefit of taxes. I used to have my own doctor with my own family. If I get sick, I have a doctor assigned to me. And I used to pay 50% of my money every month. It's, it's a lot if you look at the paycheck, but it was worth it. And if you go to Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they're very happy to do so. So optimal tax policy needs to be thought through properly. Increasing taxes has proved to be regressive. And there are so many school of thoughts. Uh, free market champions would want lower taxes because lower taxes tend to spur growth because businesses are able to invest more and they're able to hire more people. And there's that trickle down effect. Democrats and the others, they would want lower, higher taxes, especially for those in the high income brackets. So that's, that's the conversation you see in the American system. I just wanted to comment also on what can we do? What you, you said, eh? political, I, I want to put this polit vested interest in political economy. We are dealing with human beings. The problem and the fact of the matter is those people who are doing all this, they're not coming from Mars or from Venus. They are here. They are people who are built and molded within our societies. They are people whom we know those who steal, supposedly, those who make policies, it's the society, the way it is configured. And what is it that we want as a society, as a Kenyan society, as an African society? What is it that defines us? And then that shapes the way policies are made, that shapes the political economy and vested interests, that shapes how the economy is organized and how the countries can be governed. Thank you. Uh, I'll go before we pass the hard ones back to the speaker. Uh, <laughs> so I turn to return the favor. Uh, but let me speak to the question of governance. What do we do? I think there, are, there, in my opinion, there are three things that we need to do. One is that we need to start aggressively to restore a value system that has human dignity at its core. I think if I was to ask each of you here, uh, uh, is corruption bad? Many of you will tell me, yes, it is bad. But if I asked you, suppose you are the one benefiting, many of you will struggle with the answer. Uh, it will no longer be too bad. So corruption seems to be bad when it's benefiting, when others are doing it. You know, And there's a study that was done a couple of years ago, uh, about five years ago, that showed, it was basically a study on young people below 24 years of age, and many said they don't mind uh, uh, you know, engaging in corrupt activities so long as they are not caught. Um, and it was a figure. You know? So the question around going back to a values that puts human dignity, that the person who deserves public health care, when I steal those drugs, I am denying somebody human dignity. So the values question for me, I think is central. And it starts with, you know, a campaign for individual and celebrating people who are living those values. Today, it's almost difficult 
to find people celebrating people who are doing the right thing. You know, our news, our pages are all full of the guys who have stolen. You know, the papers yesterday were about off the hook, uh, if you saw, saw it. You know, guys who had cases, and now because they have been nominated to be CSAs and PSAs, now their cases have been dropped, you know, just like that. And there are many other issues like that. So values are for human. The second one is that we are not going to run away from this rule of law. The reason why other countries progress is not because they don't have thieves and thugs and robbers among themselves, but it's because there is rule of law that if you are found mismanaging, you step aside, you resign. It's not a matter of discussion. You know, uh, it's not a matter of having an ESCC chasing after you uh, or, a, or a, an office of the director of public prosecutions. So the rule of law, because our constitution, our penal code, I think we actually did a big blunder by putting corruption as, as an economic crime and not treating it as theft under the penal code. Because today, if you steal my phone right now, if one of you disappears, this is one of the person's phones here. We are not going to try and investigate you. First, we'll put you in Kasarani Police Station. I don't know which is the nearest, Kahaskari. First, you'll be locked in there as we investigate about you. But then we have given a name, you know, we've tried to, you know, to create an image of corruption. And therefore, it also becomes, you know, desirable. You know, it's like a norm, it's a thing, but it's theft. It's robbery with violence even, you know, uh, because there are lives that are being lost when you steal drugs, when you, so the rule of law, we are not going to, and what that does is that it shows, you know, uh, and, and, and lastly, I think there is great need for a societal pride in honoring the social contract. I just want to explain a bit what Anthony said. But when I elect a government, when I assign a government to perform certain functions on my behalf, this is delegated authority and I expect to pay my fair share of taxes and get public services in return. It cannot just be one way. And that is why many Kenyans are preferring not to pay taxes because if I'm still going to pay for private education, if I'm still going to pay for private water or dig a borehole, if I'm still going to pay for private hospital and, every, and, you know, and, and employ an Ascari to stand at my gate, and yet all these are, are services that are supposed to be public services. And my hope is that we can start restoring that because then what it does is that it creates confidence you know, uh, within. For me, those are the governance questions we are talking about. And those are the choices. Some of them are very tough choices, uh, uh, which will be, uh, uh, will be critical. Finally, I think we've talked about many other things, but allow me to speak just in a minute on domestic debt. It is possible to leave this room imagining that our biggest problem in this country is the Chinese. I have had it said out there, or is the Eurobond. But let us remember that our biggest risk as of now is repayment of interest to our domestic debt. And the reason for that is that we are borrowing locally at about 12%. It's between 11 and 12%. I won't go into who borrow, who's, who, 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 who lends money and whether government is actually lending itself money. That's a story for another day. But the fact that you have right now, this year alone, 550 billion of the 1.3 trillion that we are going to be paying in debt is domestic interest. It's interest to the local market. What has that done? It means that the, it has crowded out private investors from being able, because if a bank is going to make money and make profits by lending government, which is a, an assured, lend, I mean, a borrower, why should they bother with, you know, with risky ventures and social enterprises and ideas of young people that may not work out? And therefore, banks sit, sit pretty. But the other question, but, but, but and that's why I talked about even uh, 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 being, 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 being critical, that this money, by being held by government, when it is paid to the people lending, it's not necessarily going to spur the economy. Because again, we are not talking of lending from a million, two million, three million Kenyans. You're talking of a very small portion. I think it's critical we start discussing the domestic debt because I think that also will open up the market and the economy uh, for participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We give the floor to the chief guests to make his interaction. Dr. Rose, you are welcome. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and I really appreciate uh, what has come from there. 
Uh, and what I'll do is just to add to what they have. Uh, one of the things that was asked is about uh, the scope and uh, uh, the levels of debt, I mean, the levels of tax rate. And of course, the aspect of uh, can you get tired actually to, to pay? Uh, and in the literature, you all know about the lava calf that uh, at a certain level, uh, you'll actually find the uh, uh, tax rates, I mean, uh, tax revenue going down because everybody is trying to either evade uh, paying uh, or the like. But the aspect I want to bring in is um, the structure of our economy. What has changed? Uh, you notice that uh, a lot of farm establishments, a huge proportion of a 70% of the farms are informal, micro and small enterprises of which most of them are informal. And in addition to being informal, majority of them are one person's farm, which means that you have a farm that is employing one person. Now, informal sector contributes very little uh, to the tax revenue. They contribute very little because uh, the structures for enhancing that tax base are still a little bit weak. Uh, when I was coming, uh, what was my driver told? Turn right, turn left, you get there. That's where you'll get this center. That's where you'll get. You go to Europe, what will they tell you? Building number 805 is where you are going. Everything is addressed. There's an address. When COVID hit, it was impossible to support even the informal sector because you didn't even know where to locate them. They don't have an address. There is an effort to do a national addressing system in Kenya. And for me, if that is done, uh, first of all, you'll be able to locate where the informal sectors are. And what will you be able to do? You'll be able, first of all, to support them, to give them a very uh, good environment to work from. And they will be able actually uh, to contribute to the tax base. At the moment, there are very few firms uh, that are doing that. And yes, they can become tired. And I think it's for that reason that there is a proposal to limit the turnover tax for MSCs to 1.5%. And at the same time, to actually come up with a ministry uh, that would focus attention on MSCs and see how we can tap into them uh, in generating uh, more tax revenue. The other thing I also want to uh, mention, uh, um, uh, and I know uh, Gachanja, yeah? Gachanja talked about the, the IMF. Very good. IMF is like a cooperative. How many of us be belong to a circle, a cooperative like that? If you, if you give 10 shillings, and I give 200 shillings, and we come back to look for a loan. The person who has given 10 shillings, how much do they get? 30. The one who has given 200 shillings, 600. It's the same thing. The amount of money you get from IMF is dependent on your vote. And the vote is similar to the amount that uh, you also contribute in a, in a circle. What has China perfected? China has perfected enhancing its multilateralism, <laughs> ensuring these multilateral institutions that we are all members of, it increases its voting power. 
And right now, if you look at China with its lemimbi, it is part of the SDR currency of IMF. And it has actually enhanced almost overtaking the veto power of US in the IMF. It's, it's there. What can Kenya do to enhance its voting power in these institutions? Grow your economy, expand your exports, get uh, uh, the economy opening up, uh, have technology, uh, high level manufacturing. That's what uh, China did. And we, are, we need to ask ourselves, are, very, are we strategic such that these institutions, when we go later to get funding, we get enough. Recently, SDRs were distributed at the tune of 650 billion US dollars. How much did uh, Africa get? Less than 7% less than seven percent why less than seven percent because africa has less than five percent vote at the imf you see the relationship so the same way you go to a circle you move from 10 shillings and you decide i need now to get to 50 shillings to get to 100 is the same thing we need to start playing that international uh I don't want to call it game, but international relations uh, that are supportive of our interests, not uh, others. And then finally, uh, I want to look at, uh, I want to attempt this aspect of psychological, but from a very different point of view uh, and reminds all of us of uh, the Ricardian equivalence, yeah? Uh, which says that um, since you know Tomorrow, there is a debt that will be paid. Today, you start saving. You start saving for tomorrow. And in that context, I'm trying to uh, uh, bring in the psychological aspects, and I'm sure that Anthony can maybe expand it better than I. In that situation, the argument from that framework is that when you increase savings, you are, are not competing with the uh, consumption, then you'll find the interest rates going down. Remember what I said about the stability of debt. When R is less than G, you are better. When R is greater than G, you are worse off. So the argument is there for that from the Ricardian equivalence. It doesn't matter whether you're paying tax this year or is the next generation that is paying tax. The effect would be the same if we were all prepared for it in terms of saving today uh, for tomorrow. But the question is, you are saving from what? Thank you. Thank you very much. So what we will do now is that uh, uh, our colleagues online, you are welcome and we appreciate all of you. We have many questions from them, but uh, I will tell us, Julie, to be very selective and read just about three or four, then uh, you answer them, then we see whether we can get, just pick one or two from here, and uh, I will hand over the closing ceremony to Professor so the latest by 5.15, 5.20, we should leave here so that the students will go and prepare for class tomorrow. So Julie, come and read some of the questions from those online. Thank you so much to our online participants. So I'll be uh, selective. Maybe I could just ask this one. Could one be right to say that Kenya is experiencing that overhang? If yes, what is the short-term and long-term effects on the country's sovereignty? Uh, the assumption of this theme today is that COVID-19 is to blame for the growing debt, but uh, is the answer not in irresponsible fiscal management or driven by self-interest? 
Uh, the last one. Since 2003, the external borrowing has increased exponentially. Is it worth the economic development we have witnessed in the same period? Just uh, maybe one last one. What measures can government put in place to mitigate risks of defaulting and ensure that there is a proper debt management in cases of unrest, pandemic, such as a period of COVID-19, land, any other situation that can extreme, severely cause disruption in the economy? I think I will just leave those. So time is tightly against us, so response very briefly. And we hope, students, we hope to leave here Latest by 5.15, so relax. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you uh, for those uh, those questions. Uh, first, I, re I respond to the last question, that is the risk of default. Uh, what is it that we can be able to do uh, to mitigate the risk of default of our debt? And one of the things that uh, uh, when I look at our system of um, uh, managing our economy, there is an area that we are really forgetting, which is very, very, very critical. That is uh, some of our productive sectors of our economy. And one of them is uh, agriculture, which is very, very, very critical. With a vibrant agricultural sector, number one, it reduces the burden of a government uh, uh, supporting, for example, consumption. For example, in the recent past, we have been hearing of subsidies and so on and so forth. So you can imagine a family uh, or a household that is able to meet its uh, food expenditure because uh, in developing countries like Kenya, now we are, uh, or we, are, we, are uh, we, we have been recategorized, but many of our households are uh, are quite low in terms of uh, in terms of income and if we can have a way of reducing uh, the household budget for example on these basics like uh, like food then uh, something is left for saving and then investment and therefore uh, when the government uh, this can reduce the government burden on uh, supporting uh, this uh, uh, supporting these uh, households the issue of irresponsible fiscal uh, management, I agree with the person who asked uh, that question. If we, are not, uh, if we are not responsible in managing what we collect as taxes uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of also government expenditure, where does our money go uh, in terms of uh, ex uh, uh, government expenditure? If we are not responsible, then we are likely to have uh, that gap is also likely to expand. Uh, G is likely to be less than R, and therefore we are likely to have more debt. And this, as the first questioner asked, uh, the issue of debt overhang. We can find ourselves in the uh, in the debt overhang section. So thank you, thank you. I think there are, another one can continue. Okay. Yes. <laughs> maybe maybe I can comment on. Um on the debt overhang. I, I wouldn't, debt overhang is a very strong word to use. <laughs> As an economist, I'll be very careful to use that word. But let's go back to the basics. The, 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 some of the indicators that Dr. Ngogi shared is the ratio of debt to GDP. And currently Kenya is, is, is floating somewhere around 67%, 64%. What does that mean? Whatever you're earning, whatever you're generating, whatever economic activities you're doing as an economy, 67% goes to paying debt. You only have 33%. That's quite alarming. I mean, let me put it that way. That's quite alarming. That means whatever you are, the Y, the C plus I plus G, X minus M, he was referring to the, the standard, uh, uh, the cross Caucasian uh, Keynesian GDP equation. Basically, whatever you're earning as an economy is paying to service the debt. So it's, it's really unsustainable. Maybe let's not use overhang, we say it's unsustainable for the economy because it has a, a lot of ripple effects. If not managed properly, which is why I think governments are now top of that management, they can, have, they can have what we see in Sri Lanka, what we see in Sierra Leone. And I want also to tie into the question of the psychological effect of debt. You try to talk about Ricardian, Ricardian equivalence, but maybe I can use layman's language so that they can better understand. 
think of debt as an international, inter intergenerational thing. Think of it as intergenerational game. You know, when you're wealthier, They don't want me to say what I want to say. <laughs> so if you are if you are rich, your generation is guaranteed to be rich unless they're stupid. Pardon my language. And if they're able to manage that wealth, it's bequest intergenerationally, right? The same applies when you are in debt. It's bequest intergenerationally. Right now, they cry out to the public is you're paying so much taxes because why high taxes they take away your disposable income. So if you had 10,000 to spend, now you have 5,000 to spend. That affects your spending, it affects your aggregate demand. Of course, it can have an impact on aggregate supply in the longer terms. But let's, let's look at you as a, a, an economic human being, rational human being. You have, you have less to spend because you're paying a lot of in taxes, you're paying out in many other things. That affects you as an individual. So if you, are, you, you have children now, and the country continues perpetually to be in debt. That means, and there's no way for you to get a job, you're juakali. The children that you're going to bear, they're going to go through that intergenerational impact. So the same headaches you have now, your children are going to have the same headaches. Why? Because when they grow up, they'll continue to service the debt that continues perpetually because of high interest rate payments, for example, because of mismanagement of debt. So that can tend, they, I, I don't have any empirical evidence to that effect, but I can quickly deduce if that debt continues to roll over, you are going to pay, your grandson is going to pay, they are going to pay over and over and over and over again. The tensions you're feeling now because you're paying high taxes to help government service the debt. And by paying high taxes, it takes it chops off your disposable income. You have less to spend. You have less to enjoy. You have less time for leisure because you don't have money to spend. You spend so much of your time strained to work and end to sustain your family. That can be bequeathed and transferred to your generation unless there's something that to break that cycle you will continue to be psychologically affected. Okay, let me come back to the question on uh, uh, what are the measures that government can use? I think the last question that somebody asked, and I want to, I want to echo something to do on reserves that you talked about. What do you do with reserves? The confrontation that we have, the really contentious issue that our policymakers are facing, okay, they accumulate reserves in foreign currencies. But then they are confronted with one challenge. Should I use those reserves to pay debt? Or should I use those reserves to import oil and gas? So whatever buffer you are keeping, because most of emerging economies have been accumulating reserves dominated in foreign currencies because every debt is in dollars, in pound, in euro. So they have so much reserves. And right now the CBK, would at least in East Africa, you need to have at least five months, five to six months reserve in foreign currencies to be able to pay for your import bill. But this import bill, which you need for your necessities, Kenya is non-oil importer. You import oil from outside, you import fuel from outside, right? Intermediary goods that you need for production are coming from outside. You need foreign currencies. But at the same time, you are confronted with the challenge, how do I strike balance between using my foreign currency reserve for paying debts, which are dominated in foreign currencies, about 30% that Dr. Ngug showed us, or how do I have to use my foreign reserves for uh, paying for the basic necessities? So I think that it's a balancing act. And this is why I said earlier on, improve export competitiveness, make your economy very competitive, and start thinking, and this is where the continental free trade area, the CFTA comes in very handy in helping countries, championing countries to build their productive capacities. Very important. When you're able to build your productive capacity, you tend to rely less on imports and, 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 and export more. So you're able to earn more foreign currencies, but you're spending less in terms of foreign currencies to, out to other countries because you have capacity within your economy to be able to sustain your needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I say just something small on the... Yes, one sentence. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. when you, uh, when, especially when uh, we invest a lot in the in the service sector, we need we need to ask ourselves uh, whose economies are we uh, are we boosting? For example, we have talked a lot about uh, SGR. We need to ask ourselves when the SGR is in use, who is uh, who is uh, mainly eco uh, benefiting uh, from that SGR? Uh, when we are using our phones, I know everybody here has a, a mobile phone. Uh, that mobile phone, uh, who, who benefits? Who benefits most from it? For example, the transactions that uh, when you are communicating, uh, does it does it uh, does it help or does it help us to know uh, or does it create an economic an economic transaction? Or does it end up benefiting the manufacturer? And we need to ask ourselves, who is the manufacturer of that mobile, mobile phone? So that even as we, uh, we ask ourselves and we are happy that we are investing heavily on infrastructure, we also need to go to a second question to ask ourselves, is it helping our productive economy or is it a conveyor belt, for example, uh, to bring about imports from other countries and therefore benefiting our uh, benefiting other countries so uh, investing heavily on infrastructure we also need to be very very careful about our productive sectors thank you thank very you. much uh, i've narrated that uh, we should be running up a bit but we'll allow him and then dr rose to make a few closing comments and then we we'll go to the closing ceremony Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll actually make it uh, very, very, very brief. One, I think it's time to officially declare we are in a crisis economically. And when you declare that, what happens, you've seen it when we did that with HIV and AIDS, you turn the entire machinery to actually address the problem. Because I don't think we have acknowledged, I have just heard people say, all is well, all is well. What Dr. Rose presented to us shows all is not well. If you're spending seven shillings of your 100 shillings on non-discretionary spending, you are in trouble. And that is month on month. You know? And the 100 shillings is promissory because this is revenue collection. Uh, so it's not like you have it upfront. I think we have a crisis. And the moment we declare and acknowledge we have a crisis, then we are able to turn our tables around and say, desperate times call for desperate measures. Let's do something about it. Secondly, I think... The question of agriculture, you know, we talk about agriculture being the backbone of our economy, uh, but the truth of the matter is that you can only go so far with agriculture because agriculture is a raw material producer. Unless we invest more in manufacturing where there is more value, value addition, that's where you create a value chain, that's where you create employment, that's why you open different sectors. So for instance, you know, a cow ceases to be just meat. You also have hides, you have skins, you know, you have all that production line. Uh, uh, then then, then, then we, we, we basically are just feeding, feeding ourselves and not able to go past, you know, the point of uh, uh, employment creation. I'll leave it there for now and for today. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I, I wanted to apologize for the non-economists like me in the room. We have been bombarded with so many tough, tough words. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, but I believe we, 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 try, we will manage the understanding. Dr. Rose, briefly. I'm very happy that we have converted one to be an economist today. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good achievement. I also want, I don't want to spend a lot of time, uh, but one of the things you need to look at, I know this, today we are looking at COVID, but remember during COVID, there were so many things that were happening. One is that we had just come from the desert locust in invasion, yeah? Immediately after that, what happened? Drought situation was uh, declared in the country as a, uh, yeah, in uh, September, 2021. Immediately after that, we have the Russian uh, Ukraine crisis. So we have all these, uh, uh, all these crises, I mean, all these shocks that are coming. I think uh, uh, the, the thing I want to throw to this team is uh, how do you manage to successfully get out of this uh, successful crisis that 
we are facing and that are affecting completely the economic activity so that uh, we can manage debt uh, in such situation. The, se the second thing that um, I've had coming from uh, 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 the panel panelists, and I just want to maybe say it in, a, in, one, in, in one or two words, is that coherence in a policy, in the way you make policies is crucial. What he's talking about manufacturing, we're talking about agriculture, but you have seen situations where we want to promote manufacturing, but today we have metumbas in all angles, metumbas in clothing, metumbas in ICT gadgets. Have you gone to Have you gone to Moya Avenue, Tomboya Street, and the like? You can get anything: camera, second hand, uh, lab, uh, iPad, second hand, laptop, second hand. Uh, when you go to cars, again, we are a nation of second hand mitumbas. How do we get to? I don't know whether it is it called first hand. If you have second hand, how can we get to the other hand and and manage to uh, grow the, uh, the, the the industrialization actually comes in uh, 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 in, in in this uh, situation? And then finally. Uh, the ratios I gave you of how we determine sustainability. Look at the denominator all the time. GDP, revenues, exports. I think that's why Anthony is just keeping hammering on exports because if you are able to deal with the denominators, I think life would be, would be better. And so we have a lot of space to work on uh, for us to uh, really manage uh, uh, Gachanja C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And also I want to throw it to him that that is also another jargon that uh, we are welcoming you to understand. Thanks very much. <laughs> Chair, can I allow me to just say one sentence? We are speaking to young people and it's possible for you to leave this room feeling completely dis discouraged and wondering what is this world? But may I invite you that we are looking for solutions. May I invite you to start thinking, what is this country called Kenya I want to live to in the future? And I can I start creating it? Can I start thinking of solutions? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have to bring the question time to your name. We know you have a lot of questions. What we'll do is that maybe we'll let you write it on paper, we'll give it to them, and then when they respond, we'll send the answers to you. At this point, we are coming to the closing section of the of the of the of the program, and uh, uh, there will be a proper vote of thanks. But before then, I call on Julie to do a, a, some few presentations. Thereafter, we hand over the closing ceremony to Professor Minja to handle vote of thanks, and we close ceremony. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. So from uh, APAM, we just want to appreciate all our panelists and Dr. Rose Ngugi. At APAM, we pride ourselves in bringing all the stakeholders together, including practitioners and academicians, because it is our belief that academic institutions such as Kenyatta University should anchor some of this policy making, how we make policy, and you as young academics should be part of that conversation. So we appreciate the opportunity to be at the Kenyatta University and the opportunity to interact with you panelists. We have truly, truly learned a lot. I don't know if you know this, but this lecture will be examined. So the students here have a lot to show us in terms of even showing solutions, like be part of the solution process. So thank you so much for that. At APAM, we want to present a small gesture just to appreciate you. We had already presented a small gesture to the VC earlier on just to show our courtesies. So at this point, we would just like to appreciate our chief guest, Dr. Rose Ngogi. We want to present you with something very very small to appreciate you. So we may please join the Secretary General and we appreciate. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
We shall export soon. Uh, we also would like to uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Anthony Mbeyange. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation and for joining the panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. You may have your seat, uh, please. Thank you so much. And next, we would like to honor Mr. Pachi Gashagwa uh, from Kenya School of Government, our close friends and allies. Thank you so much for joining us here. Okay, last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Abraham Rugo, our new friend from the International Budget Partnership. Thank you so much, sir, for speaking on our behalf. <laughs> okay. And then we have also something to give to Dr. Richard um, Wafula, the Dean School of Law and Social Sciences, just to appreciate uh, you being here with us, taking time off your schedule to just be with us. So thank you so much, sir. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much to all of us. Uh, I will now invite Professor Minja to lead us to the next session where we'll have a official vote of thanks, of course, from the university, and then now we'll have a small photo session. Thank you. Yeah, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone from our guest speaker, uh, DVC, and everyone uh, who has attended this uh, lecture today uh, from KU and from Department of Public Policy, we say thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I think we have uh, some other. This is to notify you that we have some refreshment. This is a serious public lecture. <laughs> so please don't leave this place. If you leave this place, others will come in and take your refreshment. And as you think about the public debt, please also think about your own Fuliza. <laughs> so, uh, Chief guest and uh, other uh, uh, the panelists, please, we have a place up here, room 151. Please don't leave before you have something also. Thank you. So we will have a photo session and we invite our high table please to join us here to have a picture. Students, please be patient with us uh, as we finish this step also and then we can go to refreshments. Uh, thank you so much. I'm doing it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will be posting pictures online just to commemorate uh, this public lecture. Thank you so much. I think without any further ado, we declare that this second lecture uh, has officially been closed. Thank you so much for everyone for making this a complete success. We look forward to meeting you next year. Yes. Can we come back next year? 
can we come back? Sure, we'll come back next year. Perhaps we can have it a little bit longer so that we can have more engagements with you. Thank you so much, Kenyatta University and Kwaheri. <laughs>